But I deserve the most, said the candle maker. Everyone uses my candles. No, said the farmer. Without food, there is no life. Surely we should get the most. And so the bickering continued. Since none of you can agree, I suggest you obtain the number you require from me. There will be no limit except for your ability to repay. The more you obtain, the more you must repay in one year's time. And what will you receive, the people asked. Since I am providing a service, that is, the money supply, I am entitled to payment for my work. Let us say that for every 100 pieces you obtain, you repay me 105 for every year that you owe the debt. The five will be my charge, and I shall call this charge interest. There seemed to be no other way, and besides, 5% seemed little enough charge. Come back next Friday, and we will begin. The cautious borrowed only a few, and off they went to try the new system. Fabian left his shop and visited all the people who owed him money. Some had more than they borrowed, but this meant that others had less, since there were only a certain number of coins issued in the first place. Those who had more than they borrowed paid back each 100 plus the extra 5, but still had to borrow again to carry on. The others discovered for the first time that they had a debt. Before he would lend them more money, Fabian took a mortgage over some of their assets, and everyone went away once more to try and get those extra five coins which always seemed so hard to find. No one realized that, as a whole, the country could never get out of debt until all the coins were repaid, but even then, there were those extra five on each 100 which had never been lent out at all. No one but Fabian could see that it was impossible to pay the interest. The extra money had never been issued. Therefore, someone had to miss out. He was still a goldsmith, making a comfortable living. At the back of his shop, Fabian had a strong room, and people found it convenient to leave some of their coins with him for safekeeping. He charged a small fee, depending on the amount of money and the time it was left with him. He would give the owner receipts for the deposit. When a person went shopping, he didn't normally carry a lot of gold coins. He would give the shopkeeper one of the receipts to the value of the goods he wanted to buy. Shopkeepers recognized the receipt as being genuine and accepted it with the idea of taking it to Fabian and collecting the appropriate amount in coins. The receipts passed from hand to hand instead of the gold itself being transferred. The people had great faith in the receipts. They accepted them as being as good as coins. Here I am in possession of all this gold, and I am still a hard-working craftsman. It doesn't make sense. Why, there are dozens of people who would gladly pay me interest for the use of this gold, which is lying here and rarely called for. It's true, the gold is, is not mine, but it is in my possession, which is all that matters. I hardly need to make any coins at all. I can use some of the coins stored in my vault. At first he was very cautious, only loaning a few at a time, and then only on tremendous security. But gradually he became bolder, and larger amounts were loaned. One day, a large loan was requested. Fabian suggested, Instead of carrying all these coins, we can make a deposit in your name and then I shall give you several receipts to the value of the coins. The borrower, off he went with a bunch of receipts. He had obtained a loan, yet the gold remained in the strong room. After the client left, Fabian smiled. He could have his cake and eat it too. He could lend gold and still keep it in his possession. Friends, strangers and even enemies needed funds to carry out their businesses and so long as they could produce security they could borrow as much as they needed. By simply writing out receipts Fabian was able to lend money to several times the value of the gold in his strong room and he was not even the owner of it. Everything was safe so long as the real owners didn't call for their gold and the confidence of the people was maintained. He kept a book showing the debits and credits for each person. The lending business was proving to be very lucrative indeed.
His social standing in the community was increasing almost as fast as his wealth. He was becoming a man of importance. He commanded respect. In matters of finance, his every word was like a sacred pronouncement. Goldsmiths from other towns became curious about his activities, and one day they called to see him. He told them what he was doing, but was very careful to emphasize the need for secrecy. If their plan was exposed, the scheme would fail, so they agreed to form their own secret alliance. Each returned to his own town and began to operate as Fabian had taught. People now accepted the receipts as being as good as gold itself, and many receipts were deposited for safekeeping in the same way as coins. When a merchant wished to pay another for goods, he simply wrote a short note instructing Fabian to transfer money from his account to that of the second merchant. It took Fabian only a few minutes to adjust the figures. This new system became very popular, and the instruction notes were called checks. Late one night, the goldsmiths had another private meeting, and Fabian revealed a new plan. The next day, they called a meeting with all the governors, and Fabian began. The receipts we issue have become very popular. No doubt most of you governors are using them, and you find them very convenient. They nodded in agreement and wondered what the problem was. Well, some receipts are being copied by counterfeiters. This practice must be stopped. The governors reasoned. Well, it is our job to protect the people against counterfeiters, and the advice certainly seems like a good idea. Secondly, some people have gone prospecting and are making their own gold coins. I suggest that you pass a law so that any person who finds gold nuggets must hand them in. Of course, they will be reimbursed with notes and coins. The idea sounded good, and without too much thought about it, they printed a large number of crisp new notes. Each note had a value printed on it. One dollar, two dollars, five dollars. The notes were much easier to carry, and they soon became accepted by the people. Despite their popularity, however, these new notes and coins were used for only 10% of transactions. The records showed that the check system accounted for 90% of all business. The next part of his plan commenced. Until now, people were paying Fabian to guard their money. In order to attract more money into the vault, Fabian offered to pay depositors 3% interest on their money. Most people believed that he was re-lending their money out to borrowers at 5%, and his profit was the 2% difference. Besides, the people didn't question him, as getting 3% was far better than paying to have the money guarded. The volume of savings grew, and with the additional money in the vaults, Fabian was able to lend $200, $300, $400, sometimes up to $900 for every 100 in notes and coins that he held in deposit. He had to be careful not to exceed this 9 to 1 ratio, because one person in 10 did require the notes and coins for use. If there was not enough money available when required, people would become suspicious, especially as their deposit books showed how much they had deposited. Nevertheless, on the $900 in book figures that Fabian loaned out by writing checks himself, he was able to demand up to $45 in interest, which is 5% on $900. When the loan plus interest was repaid, which was $945, the $900 was cancelled out in the debit column and Fabian kept the $45 interest. He was therefore quite happy to pay $3 interest on the original 100 deposited, which had never left the vaults at all. This meant that for every $100 he held in deposits, it was possible to make 42% profit, most people believing he was making only 